Welcome back to chapter 18, where we are going to talk about the most important diagram in our semester, the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. And you can see at the bottom of this overview slide, we are also going to discuss briefly how we measure the distances to stars, because I would be remiss in not completing this module about the properties of stars without including a little bit of information about how we measure distance. Now, we're going to start out by thinking about an equation we saw briefly in one of the slides earlier in this module, which relates luminosity, temperature, and radius, or size. Luminosity can be calculated if we are able to measure the apparent brightness with our telescopes and use the distance to the star to calculate luminosity. We haven't seen that equation that I'm talking about. It's the inverse square law, but we haven't really talked about it and we don't need to. But if we know the apparent brightness and distance, we can get luminosity to a star. That is fairly easy to do. And if we can measure the temperature of the star, even easier for us, because this is something we learned about briefly in chapter five, the color of a star tells us something about the temperature. The peak wavelength of the black body curve tells us something about the temperature. If we have luminosity and temperature, then we can determine the radius of stars. We mentioned briefly in the previous video that measuring the radius is quite difficult, but this is a way that we can do that. So this equation here is really telling us that the luminosity of a star is found by multiplying the power produced per area, that is sigma t to the fourth, the black body radiation, by the overall surface area of the star, 4 pi r squared, the surface area of a sphere. Now, this brings us to the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, which is the single most important diagram in our textbook and one of the most important plots in all of astronomy. And certainly you can um, go on the internet and search HR diagram and you'll find tons and tons of examples. We're going to have um, two or three examples that show up on our slides. There are plenty that you can find quite easily on the internet that don't have the Creative Commons licenses for me to be able to put them in the slides, but they will still be useful to you. In all of the cases that you find, what we should see is that something about the brightness is indicated on the vertical axis. This might be luminosity, like we've been starting to talk about, or absolute magnitude, which is a unit we talked about briefly in one of the previous videos. And along the bottom is going to be either temperature or spectral type. We have talked about both of those things. Temperature we first started to talk about in chapter 15. Spectral type, O, B, A, F, G, K, M. Those are things we talked about in this module um, in the previous chapter. Now, this particular image, this example, is from um, the European Southern Observatory, and it's color-coded for us roughly what these stars would look like in color, from very blue for very hot stars on the left to very red for very cold stars on the right. Now, the reason why this diagram was so useful, and it's worth briefly mentioning, that Einar Hertzsprung and Henry Norris Russell were two astronomers that independently, within a year of each other, were studying stellar properties and each came up with a plot very similar to what we now know to be the HR diagram, which is why it's named after both of them. They weren't even working together. They just came up with the same really useful plot. One of the biggest reasons why this is such a useful diagram is because it's not a complete scatter plot. Stars don't show up just anywhere they want to. What we will learn more, especially as we get into module five, is that what we see here indicated as the main sequence from the upper left down to the bottom right, the main sequence is a term used to describe where stars show up in this diagram for 90% of their lifetimes. As stars begin to die, they will turn into giants and supergiants. And eventually stars like our sun will leave behind white dwarfs. All of those terms show up here in this diagram. We will learn a lot more about them as we go through module five in the next um, couple of weeks. Okay, so back to the generalized 
HR diagram. Here's the HR diagram from our own textbook. We see on the vertical axis luminosity. This is in units relative to our sun. So a number of one means it's exactly as bright as our sun. 10 to the fourth means 10,000 times brighter than our sun. And 10 to the minus fourth means one ten thousandth of the brightness of the sun, much dimmer. Along the horizontal axis, we have spectral class, O, B, A, F, G, K, M. That order we mentioned back in chapter 17 is based on the work of Wilhelmina Fleming and Annie Jump Cannon. And the fact that O is on the left side, the biggest number temperature is on the left, and the numbers for temperature go down as we go to the right, kind of backwards from what we're used to with graphs, is because of the way that both Hertzsprung and Russell set up their plot. So we have to get used to that kind of backwards numbering for the temperature, big numbers on the left compared to the right, and just kind of roll with it. <laughs> so I want you to pause the video and think through where in this plot we can find the stars that are hottest, coldest, dimmest, brightest, smallest, and largest. So pause the video and write down your estimate for every single one of these, and then we will get to the answers. Okay, hopefully you pause the video. Here's your second chance. Okay, so hottest stars. I mean, we are looking for the biggest number temperature, or we are looking for O stars. And if you said the upper left, that's okay, but really the correct answer here is just to the left. All of the stars that are the hottest show up on the far left side of the diagram, whether they are extremely hot main sequence stars in the upper left or extremely hot white dwarfs in the lower left. Hottest is just on the left. On the opposite side, coldest would be on the far right where we have the M stars and it is worth making sure we understand that we should not say lower right or upper right because there are extremely cold red giants like Aldebaran or Antares and there are extremely cold main sequence stars like Proxima Centauri. Okay, the next set, dimmest stars. Dim means very low luminosity. So we are talking about the bottom part of the diagram. We can find very dim white dwarfs in the bottom left and very dim main sequence stars in the bottom right. Dim stars simply means the bottom of the diagram. And then the brightest stars would be at the very top. It is possible to have a very bright, high luminosity main sequence star like Spica or Rigel, but it is also possible to have a very bright supergiant star like Betelgeuse or Antares. Bright simply means high up on the diagram. The tougher questions, which is why they are bolded, is smallest and largest. The terms used here actually help us out quite a bit. Supergiants and giants should tell us that that upper right corner, and this time the corner actually does matter, is where the largest stars are. And so in the bottom left corner, the smallest stars, the white dwarfs, are in that bottom left corner. So the smallest stars are in the bottom and left. We need both of those specified. And the largest stars are in the top and the right. We need both of those specified. Okay, now beyond just that overall behavior of main sequence stars and giants and white dwarfs like we saw in the previous slide and this one, the one thing we can add to all of this information, here's another HR diagram with less color but more dots. When we are looking along the main sequence and only along the main sequence, luminosity can tell us information about mass because of the mass luminosity relation that we learned about for binary stars in the previous lecture video. Now, with this mass luminosity relation, what that means is 
in the upper left corner for main sequence stars specifically. The O and B main sequence stars are the hottest because they're to the left, they are the brightest because they are furthest up along the main sequence, and because of the mass luminosity relation, we can confirm that they also have the most mass out of the main sequence stars. And then the opposite for the M stars on the far right. In the bottom right corner along the main sequence, M main sequence stars are the coldest because they're on the right, they're the dimmest main sequence stars because they're in the bottom, and because of the mass luminosity relation, they also have the least amount of mass. So there's a clear trend along the main sequence. What we will learn in the next module is that that mass luminosity relation does not work once we leave the main sequence. And we will talk more in that next module about why that is. Okay, so the last thing we want to talk about before we end this entire module comes from chapter 19, section 19.2, where I'm going to briefly talk about distance because it is more important to me that you understand that we can measure distances, although it's difficult, rather than you being able to do all of the math for it. Because a lot of what this course is about is understanding how we learn what we do and not necessarily having to do all of the calculations that astronomers would, because my main goal is the critical thinking here. Okay, so distance to stars. One of the ways, and the only way that we're going to talk about in this module, the other ones will come off way um, off in module six in several weeks' time. One of the ways that we can measure the distance to stars is to use what is called parallax. Now, on the ground here on Earth, surveyors can use what we would think of almost as parallax using two different pieces of equipment. The surveyor equipment is called a theodolite. We don't need that term. But they, write, they put those on um, a surface separated from each other by a known quantity. The baseline here in the, in the picture from point A to point B, they can actually walk out and measure. And then those particular pieces of equipment, the theodolites, what they are designed to do is to measure the angle between looking at the tree and looking at the other piece of equipment and telling what that angle is. Because with trigonometry, math that we do not have to do ourselves in this class, but we need to recognize is possible to do, if we measure two of these inner angles and we know the length of that one side, we can measure the distance to the tree. Okay, I know this sounds kind of complicated, but what I want us to recognize is that we can do this with a really quick experiment I'm going to have you try right now. So, when we start to think about how this works for stars, so we'll talk about the words on this slide in just a second, but when we think about how this works for stars, instead of two separate pieces of equipment, we have the Earth at two different points in its orbit. The small little at-home experiment I'm going to have you try is going to involve one of the eyes and the other eye being the, the Earth at two different points in its orbit. And when we are trying to measure the distance to an object, we are measuring it relative to a background. So you're going to use your thumb as a nearby object and whatever's on the wall next to you as the background. Okay, so I'm going to do this with you. So you're going to hold your thumb in front of your face, doesn't have to be that close, doesn't have to be that far, and close one of your eyes, okay? And you're going to line up your thumb with something on your wall. If there's nothing on your wall, maybe put a post-it note, um, something that you can say, okay, this is lined up. Once you have everything lined up, don't move your hand or um, uh, head at all, and you're just going to switch which eye is open. So you can go back and forth if you need to. Um, and what you should notice is that your thumb, when you switch from one eye to the other eye open, your thumb appears to move against that background. So for that movement that you are seeing, 
That is what astronomers are able to do as well. In this picture here, the blue boxes are basically a view of the sky through a telescope where the red point, like our thumb, is the nearby star, and the white points are really far away stars, the background wall that doesn't appear to move. And we can see that that star actually bounces back and forth if we close one eye and then the other. If we look at this object at one point in time and then six months later, and the amount that it bounces back and forth is based on how far away it is. The other thing you can do to try this is to do this experiment we just talked about with, the thumb, with your thumb really close to you, and it will move a huge amount relative to um, the post-it note or whatever you're looking at on your wall. And with your thumb fully outstretched, doing the same thing, and it barely seems to move. Although parallax, which is this topic right now, although parallax seems very complicated, that little at-home experiment with our eyes and our thumb is a way for us to be able to see it happening right in front of us. Now, the other things I need to mention before we wrap up this video is that when astronomers measure parallax, the angle is basically how far on the sky it's moving back and forth rather than thinking about it in terms of feet along our wall. We might be thinking about it in terms of angle, where 360 degrees is all the way around, and maybe our thumb was moving a couple of degrees. Astronomers can measure that angle by comparing images from one night and another night six months later. And then the distance, if we use a simple relation, P equals one over D, as shown on the slide, the distance would be in a unit called parsecs, which is a distance, a distance unit specifically designed for stellar parallax. Parsec comes from parallax arc second, where arc second is the unit of the angle. Since we aren't really doing equations, we're not doing calculations with this equation, it is not absolutely essential that we're in the details of the units, but it is worth recognizing that a parsec is a unit we will see throughout the remainder of our semester, and it is similar to a light year. One parsec is about three and a third light years, but it is not identical. It is certainly a really big distance, like a light year is, compared to a kilometer or something like that, but we want to make sure we recognize that. The other key takeaway for parallax, the only big single concept we need to take away that we can always check for ourselves with our thumb, is that stars, the farther away they are, the less they appear to move using this parallax measurement. So we can actually only make this measurement for nearby stars. We will talk about other methods for getting distances in later chapters, but not in this module. Okay. So I know that we learned a whole lot about stars in this module. It is almost an overwhelming amount of stuff, but we want to recognize that we can keep track of this information. There are kind of tables of information in our book that might be useful. We are going to have activities beyond these lecture videos to practice with these ideas, and you can always re-watch these. It's one of the big benefits to an online class or classes with online lectures is that you can re-watch the things that don't quite make sense to us. So this is the end of the module, and we will be working with all this stuff, and when we pick back up in the next module, we will be talking about how stars live their lives and how they die. It will be a lot of interesting stuff, and I look forward to going through it with you. Bye for now.